Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Kate Edelson. I am the walk manager here at NAMI Miami Dade. If you've ever attended one of our speaker meetings, outreach events, or most recently our walk for mental health awareness, you've probably seen me around. I've been at NAMI Miami for quite a while. Um, I'm joined here today by a few very special people, including our program's assistant, Taylor Fu. Can give a wave, Taylor. Um, and also with uh, Walter Rucker from Pride Lines, as well as Dr. Palopoulos. Uh, Walter Rucker is working at Pride Lines, which is Miami's LGBTQ community center. Um, it's the mission, their mission is to support, educate, and empower South Florida's lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and questioning youth and community in a safe and diverse space to promote dialogue, wellness, and to foster social change. Um, Walter, if you want to say hi and let us know anything coming up, feel free to say hello. Yes, hi everyone. I am super excited to be here. Happy Pride Month. Um, so as Kate mentioned, I'm Walter from Pride Lines. We have quite a few events happening this month. Um, so please follow us on Instagram if you have Instagram. Our Instagram is Pride Lines. Our Facebook is Pride Lines. And our Twitter is Pride Lines. And that's the best place to see all the things that we'll have coming up. Thank you so much, Walter. Um, and so we are also joined today with Dr. Palopoulos. So Dr. Palopoulos is a pediatric psychologist at the Holtz Children's Hospital. Her clinical interests include consultation and liaison, solid organ transplantation, and somatic symptom and related disorders. Her, she advocates for sexual and gender diversity to establish a safe and inclusive community for LGBTQ plus individual, individuals. She teaches seminars and trainings regarding gender and sexual diversity and an affirming care approach across medical departments. Dr. Palopoulos is a member of the Society of Pediatric Psychology and has co-authored several peer-reviewed publications and presentations. We are very lucky to have her with us today and we really appreciate her taking time for us. And so I'm gonna let her go ahead. She has a special presentation prepared for you. Thank you so much, Dr. Palopoulos. Thank you so much for the intro and for having me. I'm really excited about today's presentation slash discussion conversation, and I hope it can be an open platform for everyone. I use the slides mostly to guide the conversation and display a lot of the things I'll be talking about, but um, just how you all introduce me. So I'm Dr. Palopoulos. My pronouns are she, her. I'm a pediatric psychologist. Um, I specialize in working with uh, medically hospitalized kiddos, and I also specialize in teaching seminars regarding gender and se sexual diversity. So um, just to get started, I have no disclosures to present, but I do have some takeaways that I'm hoping will be our main points for today's discussion. And that's first to understand the differences between gender and sexuality, and then identifying the health disparities in the current mental health outcomes for LGBTQ plus youth. And lastly, and importantly, strategies for cultivating acceptance, openness, and affirming environments for our LGBTQ plus youth and families. So why does this all matter? There are many, many reasons. And first is that one in five of Generation Z adults identify as LGBTQ+. About one out of three Gen Z individuals mentioned that they know someone who may be non-binary or transgender. And I think one of the most concerning statistics are those related to suicidality among our LGBTQ plus youth. So during the first half of 2021, one in four LGBTQ youth attempted suicide and nearly half seriously contemplated suicide. We see that 50 per, almost 50% engaged in self-harm in the past year, and that rises to 60% for our transgender and non-binary youth. Just across the board in terms of depression, anxiety, and trauma, LGBTQ plus youth are at significantly increased risk and are demonstrating much higher levels of depression, anxiety, trauma. Um, and another really dismal finding is that one in three LGBTQ youth report being physically threatened bullied or harmed because of their LGBTQ plus identity at school. Um, and you know what's an even more unfortunate as home that one in four teens are often forced to leave their homes after they come out to their parents or their family and almost 70% experience family rejection related to their LGBTQ plus identity. So now that we're understanding the mental health outcomes, some people may think that, oh, so maybe being LGBTQ makes people prone 
towards suicidality or homelessness or poor mental health outcomes, but it's actually minority stress theory. And what this theory really just gets at is the understanding that sexual and gender minority individuals and people, they often face bullying, family rejection, employment discrimination. They face a lot of just ostracization and feeling less than in shame, which then can be internalized. And that's the pathway that we often see relates to negative mental health outcomes. So it's more so the experience they're having externally and internally that's leading to these poor mental health outcomes because we know that LGBTQ plus individuals are not inherently prone to these outcomes. So knowing that we can think about what can we do externally to create better affirming spaces to improve these mental health outcomes. So I really focused on this slide because I was getting in my own head because it, it's hard, like we live in a very binary world. Um, binary meaning that it's one or the other, it's this or it's that, it's zero or one, it's yes, it's no, it's male, it's female, it's heterosexual or gay. And this is a very oversimplification of our world. So what I really want us to try and get in the mindset of thinking while we enter this discussion is recognizing that gender and sexuality exists on a spectrum, right? So a spectrum as opposed to binary is a way that we classify things in terms of position on a scale with extreme points. So for example, if you see here in the photo that I have, if we think of zero being female, one being male, we lose all the nuance in between. And this applies with sexuality, right? If that zero were, um, heterosexual and that one is gay, we're losing all the nuance and the detail and the uniqueness of individuals. So what we do know is that gender and sexuality are not binary. It is not this or that. It is not yes or no. Rather, they're completely distinct constructs that exist on this spectrum and they hold space through fluidity and per for people to move throughout their identities throughout life. And to be honest, in psychology, we very much dislike binary because that's often a distortion is seeing things only as this or that. And that really loses the uniqueness of the human experience. So I want us to start thinking in that framework while we move into today's discussion. Um, just some terminology for those who may be a little unfamiliar. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about biological sex. And what that is, is that's a designation of one of three categories, male, female, or intersex. And that's based on a combination of hormones, chromosomes, and sexual reproductive systems that an infant is born with. And often that's how a child is labeled as male, female, or intersex once they're born. Now that's one category and that's biological sex. When we move towards gender identity, this is really a person's inner sense of identifying and feeling like female, male, another gender, both, or genderless, or the fluidity of gender. Because again, we're talking about it on a spectrum. And then gender expression, it's really just, it's the external presentation, right? It's how we communicate our gender to the world, right? Our clothing, our hairstyle, our mannerisms, our speech, our behavior. Um, so that's more of the external presentation of one's gender, where gender identity is our internal sense of self. And then biological sex is what we are assigned at birth based on our external sex characteristic. And the big highlighted point here is that biological sex does not equal gender identity and it does not equal gender expression. Okay, so often when we think of kids, we really need to think of them in developmental stages, right? You often hear, um, how do I talk to my six-year-old about something? And then how do I talk to my 16-year-old about something? Different, different, um, things are used at those different ages. So when we think of gender, I often like to help educate the different stages of gender development. So like we mentioned at birth, gender, which is really sex, is assigned at birth based on external genitalia. And then around age two, kids really start to notice the physical differences between males and females. And then around age three, um, kids can easily label themselves as boy or girl. It's often you'll see like a kid on the playground that will be like, I'm a boy or I'm a girl, right? They're, and they're often binary views or I'm, I'm a gender or I'm, I'm gender fluid. And that's the reality of the world that we're living in because there's been some more acceptance. So people are not afraid to be who they are. And because kids are so honest, they wanna express who they are and how they feel. So then we see by age four, children have a really solid sense of their gender identity. So thinking of that, if a child at age four can express like, I feel like I'm a boy or I feel like I'm a girl, 
children who assert a more gender diverse identity are very consistent and clear in their gender, just as their de developmentally aged match peers. And then at age six, children start to develop this, um, almost like this affinity towards playing with children of the same sex. But we often see that transgender and non-binary children will describe disappointment about this. And they really dislike this gendered play or being assigned to certain groups. Um, and then as kids are moving towards puberty, we're seeing that this is really like even a more nuanced situation because there's the complication of more sex-based segregation, right? Once once kids and en kids enter puberty, that's when we're seeing more of um, the physical characteristics that come up in terms of biological sex. So this may or may not present a crisis for some individuals who may identify as transgender and non-binary because it really starts to delineate more of the biological sex. Okay. So I've, I've gone through a lot of terminology. It's just often helpful so we can understand when we're talking with people. Um, but some quick points about gender terminology. Cisgender, often the shorthand cis, is a gender identity that aligns with society's expectation based on the sex someone is assigned at birth. So for example, I was assigned female at birth and my gender identity, I identify as female. So I'm a cisgender female. And then transgender shorthand being trans, this is a gender identity that doesn't align with society's expectation based on the sex someone is assigned at birth. So for example, I just said, you know, I was assigned female at birth. If I identified my gender identity to be male and that's what aligned with me is then I would be a trans male. We know that individuals who are trans, they are often transitioning and affirming into living as a member of a gender other than what would be expected from what's assigned sex at birth. And then, you know, that's kind of almost a binary way to see it. But again, we have to remove the binary and we have to shift towards the spectrum. So if we're thinking like, okay, if people are like, okay, I kind of got it like cisgender and transgender, right? But again, we're losing the nuance. And that's where non-binary, gender diverse, gender queer come in. And this describes individuals whose gender identity does not align with binary gender-based expect expectations, right? Not one or the other. And many can think of themselves as, there's a lot of different terminology for this, which is why it's really important to ask people how they identify and to ref reflect the language they use. So some people may say that they're genderless or they're gender fluid. Um, they may be a third gender, more gender creative or gender non-conforming. So these are terms that we often see. Okay, and you know when we we think about gender diversity and gender identity, we're often thinking about the name someone likes to be called, and then that often follows by pronouns. Um, I'm sure most people are familiar with you know I think in the more recent years there's been a big movement in the importance and inclusivity of asking someone's pronouns and identifying yourself with your pronouns. So we want to make sure that we're never making assumptions about individuals. So you cannot know a person's pronouns just by looking at them or knowing their gender identity. So if your child expresses desire for certain pronouns, it's important that you provide support and ask questions and honor that for them. And it's totally normal and it's okay that mistakes happen. What's important is recognizing correcting and not continuously bringing it up and making the person uncomfortable. Some people may think, okay, it's just a pronoun. Is that really important? And it really is. There's a lot of data that shows that chosen name use and pronoun use is linked to reduce depressive symptoms, suicidal behavior, suicidal ideation among transgender adolescents. So, I mean, even trans and gender diverse youth who have their pronouns respected, attempt suicide at half the rate of those who do not. So it is very intrinsically important to someone to feel respected in their identity and be referred to by the pronouns that they feel fit them. Okay, so now we're gonna shift gears, but still we're keeping our non-binary view of the world, our spectrum view of the world into sexual orientation, which is a completely different concept and construct from gender identity. So sexual orientation is really the combination of one's sexual identity, Often people may identify as gay, straight, queer, bi. This is really our emotional and our physical attraction that we feel towards other people. So, you know, most may be familiar with these terminology, gay individuals who are primarily attracted to members of the same sex and or gender, lesbian women or feminine identified people who are attracted to other women or identified feminine identified people. Bisexual is a person who's attracted to more than one sex and or gender. And this isn't an even split. Again, it's not binary. It's not 50% this, 50% that. 
It's how they choose to interact with the people in their world that they're attracted to. And then pansexual is a person who experiences attraction to individuals of all gender identities and expressions. Um, and asexual, it's more a person who may have less interest in sexual activity with others and still can have this desire for emotional intimate relationships. Um, I think a lot of recent television shows have popularized terms like um, pansexual or um, different terminology like demisexual and terms that really get at the connection between two people and the emotional connection before establishing more of an, a physically intimate connection. Okay, so putting this all together because we've gone over a lot is this wonderful graphic and this is the gender unicorn. Many may be familiar with it. If not, it's lovely. You can see here again, we're talking about spectrums and we're talking about fluidity to move through the spectrum. Spectrums. And you can see where gender identity lies on the gender unicorn, that internal sense of identifying your gender. Then our gender expression is our, are the external part of the unicorn. So how we express our gender to the world, what we wear, how we speak, um, how we style our hair. And then our sex assigned at birth is our like external sexual genitalia that is often designated once we're born. And then when we see the hearts from the gender unicorn, meaning who we are physically and emotionally attracted to. So I went into so much detail of all these concepts that this graphic just sums up really nicely. Uh, and this is a really excellent graphic to also explain things to kids. Um, so now we understand that LGBTQ plus youth are at significantly increased risk for poor mental health outcomes, including increased suicidality, homelessness, trauma, and bullying discrimination. We've gone over the terminology so we can honor and respect children and individuals in our world. And now we're gonna shift more in how we can intervene and how we can support our youth. And the first thing is family. Family is so critical. Family acceptance shows to protect LGBTQ plus adolescents from suicidal behavior, depression, and substance abuse. Youth with accepting families, they report higher self-esteem, overall health, and social support. I think one of the most profound statistics is that having one accepting adult reduces suicide by 40% for an LGBTQ plus young person. I mean, that's astounding. That, that truly, you know, that's a moment to really imagine how much you can change the outcome of a child's life by simply accepting them for who they are and who they identify as. So, a lot of parents will ask me, okay, well, let's say I do wanna be inclusive. Let's say I wanna be supportive, whether I'm an ally, whether I'm raising a family and I don't know if my child is LGBTQ or, hey, I have a child that identifies as LGBTQ plus. The great thing is that these strategies are for everyone to use, right? When we create language with kids that shows compassion and affirming language, we create more compassionate people in this world. We create better spaces for people. So this really starts early on with kids. So using language with kids that they can understand, right? What is family? What is love? What does that mean? What does that look like? In the thought bubbles, you can see I've used just some examples of how we can talk to kids, right? So, you know, if um, a friend, if a child comes home from school and they say like, oh yeah, I saw that, you know, blah, blah, blah's mo moms picked them up. Like, why does blah, blah, blah have two moms and I only have one? You know, very simple language can be, well, some kids have one parent or two parents, like mom or dad, mom and mom dad and dad, grandparent and mom. So families can look really different. Not every family may look like our family and that love can come in many different forms. And what's really important is the core of what family and love is. And that's that we keep each other safe. We respect each other and we love each other. So talking to your child about diversity among families at an early age really helps them understand the context of the world they're living in. Um, this simple language then, like I mentioned, it launches this narrative of openness and acceptance towards all people moving forward in their life. So continuing with inclusive language, you can tell that I really love language um, because it creates the context of the world we live in. Um, kids are really curious, right? Like I work with kids who have um, a lot of different medical conditions and they'll often say to me like, oh, blah, 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 I asked about my scar. So I just told him what it was, right? So it's it's not that kids are trying to be mean at times, it's just that they're curious, so they ask because they wanna know. So it's really important that as parents, we provide the language for them to understand. So things like, we don't always know just by looking at someone how they may feel or how may they identify. So I wonder why you're so curious about 
this person that you saw, right? Is it different than what you're used to seeing? And how can we talk about that as a family? Um, I often hear things such as like, oh, like that toy is for a boy or that toy is for a girl. And I'll say as someone who was obsessed with Batman as a kid, I was always told that was a boy's toy, but I loved it. And my, my parents were okay with that. And they wanted me to play with the toys I liked. And you can easily say to a child, like, well, toys are for all kids or in our family, we play with all the different toys. It's not a boy toy or a girl toy. So emphasizing approaching others with kindness and not making assumptions and allowing expression for how kids are feeling and what they want to engage in in terms of play or interests. Um, so then, you know, that's often like language using from like early ages and school age. And then we'll often get towards um, the teen years. And it's really important at that time to support your child's exploration and self-expression. So if your child is coming to you with questions about themselves and their identities, or maybe they're disclosing the identity, it's really important to demonstrate unconditional love in that moment. Um, I recognize that we live in a world with a lot of diversity in terms of religion, in terms of culture, um, in terms of race, and community, right? So it's sometimes, like for example, parents, children of parents who are immigrants, children that may come from more religious backgrounds, there, there's a lot of nuance in that, right? I would like to say we live in an ideal world where all families will be accepting. You can also be accepting of your child and you can absolutely still struggle with aspects of their identity. What's important is that you're supporting them and you're getting support for yourself. So being really present with them, listening attentively, empathically, asking questions about their experiences, really validating how they're feeling like, wow, I, I imagine it was really hard for you to tell me something like that. Like, how are you feeling now that you told me? And then demonstrating that no matter what, you will love and protect them. Even if this is something challenging for you, you will work with them together to move towards acceptance as a family, particularly if there are barriers towards acceptance. Additionally, standing up for your child and making clear that slurs or jokes about LGBTQ plus people are not tolerated at home and ensuring that we're addressing that. Um, I think this also sets the stage for peers so a kid can then also stand up for someone at school if they see something like this going on. Um, and then if we're thinking also with teens, if, they, if a child has come out or a teen has come out to you with their gender identity or their sexual orientation, connecting them with LGBTQ plus resources and events sharing a pride parade with them, sharing the history of pride, um, the history of the LGBTQ plus culture, it often creates a sense of belongingness because many LGBTQ plus kids can feel really alone and really isolated and different. And knowing that there's a community out there and there are other people who feel the way they, they feel can be really empowering for, for LGBTQ plus youth. Um, I added some really wonderful book recommendations and family resources. I think children's books are wonderful. They can do a really great job of explaining something like I just did in like a 10 minute read with much more pictures. So these are some really lovely books about like love makes a family, about babies, about um, same sex and gender parents, uh, about gender, about gender non-binary kids, about the spectrum of gender and of sexuality. They're really wonderful books. Um, if anyone wants, you can absolutely take a screenshot. Most of these are available on Amazon. Um, like I mentioned earlier, it's it's pretty normal that families um, and parents may may struggle with expectations they had for their child when you know they maybe they thought their child was gonna be heterosexual and their child may come out as gay or lesbian. Like that can be really challenging for a family and it's okay, right? It's, it's the reality of a lot of things. And we can move towards acceptance and we can um, often grieve what a parent may thought they were gonna see for their child because that can also be tough, right? I, I empathize with parents too, because again, I wanna say that we live in an accepting world. And as you saw those statistics, sometimes parents may also feel like I wanna protect my child. I don't, I don't want them to be bullied. I don't want them to struggle. And what we know is that if we create affirming spaces at home, that can often translate to school and to other places for kids to feel safe. So that being said, there are wonderful organizations such as PFLAG and the Family Acceptance Project. They have great resources. It's a lot of support for families and parents of LGBTQ plus youth and individuals. It's a way to find community. It's a way to find resources so you can better understand yourself, your family, your child. Um, it's just, it's really great to have support. One of the hardest things is to feel alone with something. 
Um, so those are some really great recommendations. Um, and then I've also put a list. This is if someone, anyone wants to take a, a photo. These are some great resources to have, particularly um, for LGBTQ plus youth. The Trevor Project is a phenomenal organization. I think it's the largest that um, really focuses on LGBTQ plus services and crisis lines um, for individuals who may be experiencing a crisis. So you can text, you can call. There's even outside of the Trevor Project, there are really wonderful organizations for youth to get support, particularly if they're struggling from a mental health standpoint. Um, and then I just put this graphic, including Pride Lines, which is this great organization we have here in Florida that Walter's a part of. Also Safe School South Florida and Equality Florida. Um, I think for a lot of people, it's challenging being in the South. It's great that we have organizations that are fighting for LGBTQ plus inclusivity and rights. So these are just some things that you can look on their website. Um, there's a lot of resources, a lot of the uh, language and the vocabulary I went over and the terms are available there because I, I know I went through it rather quickly, but it's just a way that you can also find out more information. We also recognize that language is often evolving and changing. So again, it's always helpful to ask how someone identifies. And if it's something that you're unfamiliar with, just you know, asking like, well, what does that mean for you? Or help me understand, I wanna know more so I can support you. Um, so it's good to often be up on understanding the terminology. So I, I went through a lot of information. I hope it wasn't too fast, but I also wanted to leave time for discussion or if anyone wants me to jump back a slide and we can indulge more in some of the conversation or the material I presented, I'm really happy to do that. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, how can we get others to become more open-minded to the LGBTQ community, like especially in like minority or religious groups? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't wanna say it's like kind of a apply it to all, but just some of the stuff I went over, I think cultural humility is a really powerful thing, right? And it's the idea of coming at it with a sense of like, well, help, let me help, let me understand this person's views and where they're coming from. And then let me express my views and where I'm coming from in a, in a way that we can engage in a conversation and maybe find some common ground. Um, again, you know, it's, it gets, it gets, little, it gets complicated when we bring in other aspects of identity. And that's why intersectionality is so important, right? We know for, um, you know, Asian American and Black LGBTQ plus youth, those statistics are even higher, right? Because you're bringing in different identities. So I think acknowledging that and coming from a place of like, let me understand where you're coming from and let me explain where I'm coming from and providing education can be a kind of a platform to, to help create more of like a unity. Thank you. So you, you might not have like a, an answer or statement, I guess, about this question, but it's something that I've been kind of curious about because I saw a while ago that I think it was a Gallup um, survey that they had said that, I'm sorry, my dog is playing with her toy in the background. <laughs> um, they had said that one in six Gen Zers um, identify as LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. And there's sort of a question as to whether that's an actual shift in um, gender expression and, or sexuality, or if you know people are just more comfortable, it could be a mix. But I was just curious if you had any thoughts about that. Yeah, I, absolutely, and, and right, we have seen that, and you know that's the question of like, why are more people in our population identifying as LGBTQ? And I absolutely think it's because, although more recently there's been a lot of attacks on LGBTQ plus individuals, what we have seen is compared to years ago, there has been a movement for more acceptance and inclusion. And I think some people feel safer coming out, right? I often, I often say like, I can't imagine what it was like for people to come out in the seventies and the sixties and the fifties at times where it was illegal at times that people were being imprisoned for their identity. So I think as the society and a culture, we've moved towards more acceptance. And I will say, I'm personally excited for the next generations that are coming through. I mean, I think there's a challenging world they're coming into. And I think they're coming with open minds and with authenticity and acceptance. And I really think that's what's driving this shift, to be honest. If that's it's awesome. okay for, um, for me to kind of go back to Taylor's question, um, I loved what you said, Dr. Palopoulos, um, about intersectionality. Um, and usually when people ask that kind of question, 
I highlight intersectionality as well as a way to frame how important allyship is. So what I often say about myself is through the lens of intersectionality, I am a black queer male and my black identity is most likely gonna experience oppression. My queer identity is most likely gonna experience oppression, but my male identity actually comes with privilege. So it's important for me to understand where I am being oppressed and where I have privilege, not just so that I can advocate for myself, um, but also so I can use the privilege I have to advocate for other people as well. So when I'm talking to people who might have more privilege than I do, I talk about, I talk about those concepts and I'll say something like, I can't advocate for queer people if I don't advocate for women. It just doesn't, it just, it would never work. Um, not just because some queer people are women, but also because the oppression that women experience is very similar to the oppression that queer people experience. In fact, by principle, it's really the same thing. And through the lens of the umbrella of oppression, they're all kind of the same thing. All of these isms are connected. So we can't make the world better for just one group. We have to be intentional about making the world better for every group. That, did that make sense? I felt like a lot of words. <laughs> that, that was so important, Walter, because you actually I mean, either you or Dr. Palopoulos define intersectionality again, because I think it's such a, a word that's used so often and it's such an important concept. And I feel like sometimes it's not so well understood. Yeah, so I'll, I'll give my shorthand definition and then Dr. Palopoulos, if you have uh, something to add, then great. Um, so when I define intersectionality, I say it's a framework that helps us to understand um, where we have privilege and where we experience oppression. So there's a endless list of identities. Your race is an identity. Your gender is an identity. Your sexual orientation is an identity. Your socioeconomic class is an identity. Your religion is an identity. And in our country and throughout the world, based on your identity at a certain place in a certain time, you may have oppression or you may have privilege. I don't know if that was so so short and or extended. Perfect. But. No, thank okay. you. You explained it. That was that was lovely. Walter. <laughs> I absolutely agree. And it's it's also um, I use like the R's like it's one's act it's one's resources and one's restrictions in the world, right? What what are the resources they have? What are the restrictions? And like we mentioned, when you bring in different aspects, intersectionality, different identities, right? Like. Um, you know, sometimes we say in our society that individuals who are passing, right? So people like individuals may be black, but they're white passing or individuals who are fem like they may, they're um, gay, but they may pass as um, non-gay, for example, that they may not face certain aspects of oppression, but it's for identities that really like you can't pass or you can't hide, which we shouldn't be hiding our identities, but we live in the society is that then there's often more restrictions on those groups. And we know that the more minority groups that we fall into, the more restrictions and the tougher it is and the more discrimination we often see. I think like a really, really, really tough statistic, statistic for me is that I think it's about, I think black transgender females are one of the most targeted group of people in our society. They are murdered at five times the rate of their peers, which is just a whole, like, so horrifying and that is that comes into the intersect intersectionality of race of gender of identity so it's really ones um like walter said they're how they're viewed in the world and they're different the oppression or the resources they have uh, dr palopoulos you touched on something really important that i think sometimes is like tough to realize is that we can have that mix of both being one thing and being another thing, having the privilege of, for instance, being white, and then also having to deal with being a woman and some of this, the stuff that that comes up with. And then the things that are seen and the things are not, because like what this all comes down to a lot of the time is like, we don't know what other people are dealing with, which is why it's so important to have that kind of empathy. And so I really thank you for clarifying all of that. Um, we do have a question with how can we help our siblings to be more accepting of LGBTQ plus siblings. Yeah, um, I, I mean, I can also go back to, well, I think I can go back to my slides. Um, I don't wanna just like reiterate the things I said, but I think it's very much like the language. So um, 
like talking with so it's one thing if right if a if a sibling is struggling with their siblings gender identity or sexual orientation um, there could be a lot of perceived stigma potentially at school or by other peers is really showing how we stand up for our sibling and the importance of doing that and modeling it for our kids. And again, when we start this really early on, it be, just becomes the framework for kids to understand the world. So they're very inclined to be like, well, we don't, we don't believe people for their gender. Like, I'm not really sure why you're doing that. Right. Like this, almost this like humility of like, help me understand why you would think that's funnier that's really hurtful. I wonder why you would say that. And then that can like almost trigger another child who's bullying or having a hard time to be like, Oh, I never, I didn't, I didn't think of it that way because they may have different language that's being used at home. So the language that we're using with our kids at home, and I think also helping explain it to them of like, no, no one asks to be born transgender. Or no one asks to be born gay. It's, it's an identity that one has and that one carries throughout their life. So it's it's we we shouldn't hold shame around that we we move towards acceptance as a family so i uh, you know i don't want to keep giving a simple answer of like talking with our kids it is truly just so powerful and asking them like what about it is hard for you and validating like oh okay i could see like maybe it's because your friends are making comments that are hurtful so how do you think we can model talking to your friends so they can understand and be more accepting and then showing that and demonstrating that So one thing I do wonder about, and, and this is less about youth specifically, but um, it's as an adult, if you do have um, an LGBTQ youth in your life, let's say it's your child, what if you have to deal with other adults <laughs> that are maybe less accepting um, of that? Maybe it's in the school, you know, or something like that. Like, do you have any recommendations um, cause I think with kids, like you've done a really great job of explaining, you know, how to talk to them about these concepts, but sometimes I think it's almost more difficult to talk to the adults. And so I was wondering if you had any extra advice about that specifically. Yeah. And, you know, what's unfortunate is what's happening currently in the world with, um, like certain, just through certain like political aspects is that we know that um, affirming school environments also reduce suicidality among LGBTQ plus youth about uh, LGBTQ plus youth who learn about LGBTQ plus issues at school are 23% less likely to attempt suicide. So while we know this, unfortunately, we're living in a time where there's a lot of pushback towards that at school. So I think um, if you're living in an estate, particularly where there is openness and discussion about gender identity and sexuality and diversity is encouraging and reaching out to the school about, you know, it's, it's somewhat similar if a child is being bullied, regardless is like talking to the school and about, okay, how does the school intervene? And can the school psychologist get involved? Can the counselor get involved? How can they speak to all the students to understand that like we do not stand for bullying and we do not bully or we do not do hurtful things because of someone's identity. I think in terms of, so it's interesting when that, question was asked, I was um, internalizing it as more of like parents who are maybe concerned about talking to other parents about their child's identity. Um, and to be honest, like, I'm going to validate that. Like, I don't know what families are going through. I don't know what other identities they hold that can be conflicting. So it's, it, it is tough. Um, I think it's, it's really the call of the parent and the child about like, who do we feel safe disclosing your identity to? And how do I still honor you at home and respect you and make sure that we all feel safe if we're around other families or other adults? Ideally, I would say like, it's just educating the adults. That would be ideal. And the reality is you have to think about a family, like what's safe for you. And, you know, I see this in healthcare a lot because if a child discloses something to me about their identity and they don't feel safe with their parent knowing, I honor that because I cannot put them in harm's way. So I may say like, how can I still respect you and your identities when I'm working with you and keep you safer on your family? So like using that context and the broader aspect of society, um, I think maybe that could be a helpful lens to think about that question. I thought that was a very tough question, Kate. Like that was, that was not an easy one. Yeah, so thanks, I'm gonna... Kate. I'm going to try to uh, help. 
Um, I think that uh, a lot of adults are not usually approaching these conversations from a lens where they want to learn. Um, and I'm gonna try to quantify that by percentage. Just a lot of adults have their beliefs and they're not coming to these conversations to learn. Um, so then that makes the education piece kind of tough because you didn't, you didn't come to me to, to learn something new, to change your perspective. You came to kind of uh, impose your values onto me, my family and my child. And my response to that is setting a boundary, um, which is just something we're challenged to do. Um, and it's not always easy, but I think that is one way that we can protect our, our LGBTQ friends, our LGBTQ youth, is creating boundaries around how and what you can say to these people that we care about and enforcing those boundaries. Like what you said was not okay. What you said was harmful. And I would appreciate if you did not repeat that or you did not talk to us in that way. Not that that, you know, will, all, will always be the rainbow at the end uh, of a tunnel, but, but uh, it's, it's another step that we can take to just say that this is not okay. Whether you want to understand or you don't, you can't treat me or my child or my family member this way. Sometimes that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do, you know, absolutely. Thank you both. Um, I think we have another question. Um, so sort of in a similar vein, how about adult family members that are not accepting, you know, like what you were saying, Walter, should we throw up a boundary? Should we limit time together? You know, how do we deal with this? So similar, similar question. If you have anything else you want to add. I certainly think so. I can say that as, um, an African-American queer person, I have been in a lot of situations with my family where they say, uh, hurtful things. And it's not always intentional, but they're still not in a place to learn. So um, unfortunately, but fortunately, we can't change people that don't want to be changed. Um, so we have to do what's best for us. So for me, that looks like limiting interactions. For me, that looks like setting boundaries and saying, hey, you said this, and I felt a way about it. And this is why I felt a way about it. Um, and sometimes out of care and, and love, there, there will be a listening ear to kind of absorb more than they had before. Thank you. Yeah, this, these, these questions are like really wonderful. And it's, it's hard because I, I want to answer them in like a one or a few sentences. And then I'm always thinking in like a psych psychotherapeutic model of, you know, again, the reality of for some people, it's like protecting your LGBTQ identity and still being able to engage with people in your life, right? You know, family, like I said, is critical. And while some families may not be accepting, there's still often LGBTQ plus individuals who are connected to their non-accepting families in ways where they may just not talk about it, right? But we can talk about everything else, but we will not talk about this. And for some people that really, you have to figure out what your, like Walter said, what you're able to take in, I don't want to say tolerate, I really dislike that word, but what you're able to ex expose yourself to and be okay with. Um, and I think if a family is moving towards acceptance and understanding, that can look a lot different for someone who's just like, no, like, absolutely not, this will never change. But I like to give people some of the benefit of the doubt. I've seen a lot of families um, come to be understanding and, uh, you know, again, taking culture and humility standpoint of sometimes it's, it's just hard for people. It's hard for some generations before us, right? Like they will continue to live in a binary world. So I often take the way of like, just kind of like validating, like, wow, yeah, it's probably really hard for you to understand that that's like really different than what you grew up with or what your understanding is of the world. Um, and just so you know, like, this isn't a choice and this isn't to harm you or to ruin things for you. It's, this is who I am. And I don't mean to come to hurt you, right? So like having these difficult conversations where we're expressing how we're feeling in non-judgmental ways, I think it can it can see like what boundaries we do need to set and how much we're willing to expose ourselves to people who may be non-accepting. And then the big thing that we, you know, this can kind of get into is we often hear the term like chosen family. So a lot of people who may be in the LGBTQ plus community, they'll have a chosen family, which is 
a family that they've identified because of the acceptance and the support they feel and that that might be peers and maybe people they grew up with it may be people in completely different places right we know that um, I think a higher percentage of LGBTQ plus youth often go to college further from home right because that may be more of a safe haven for them so if there's a non-accepting environment at home, finding a way to have a chosen family or to have support is really important because that can, I don't wanna say counteract, but it can still can still help you feel a sense of belonging and it can help you get through those non-accepting spaces and people. Thank you, Dr. Palepolis. Um, someone says, my child asked me why is the LGBTQ community judged on their sexuality and not their individuality? Not sure how to respond. Say that again. So, sorry. Um, my child asked, why is the LGBTQ community judged on their sexuality and not their individuality? Not sure how to respond to the question, I guess, to, to the child, like, you know, what to, what to tell them in response to that. I mean, I, part of me is like, how old is this child? So I can think of a <laughs> language, but I'm thinking that this is like a pretty evolved question. I think it's a great question. And the big, the big word here is judged, right? Which is, I, you know, judged to me is a challenging word. It's like a kind of a harsh word. So oh, 17 years old, sorry, 17. Yeah, so I would, I would say that, um, you know, again, we're living in a world with categorizations and we try to fit people in different groups and that's what creates intersectionality and identities. So, you know, just I, one, I would ask, like, I wonder what, I wonder what sparked that question or was there an experience or something you were thinking about like a framework? Um, but I'd probably say that it's, it's not so much a judgment of their sexuality, it's an identity around their sexual orientation. And within that, you're absolutely right. There's so much individuality and so much diversity. So that's a great way to think of the world is like we are all individuals and yes, we are categorizing different identities and there's still so much individuality, right? Like that's why I go back to um, this graphic that I will not lie. I spent like so much time on and it's so simple, it's embarrassing, but right, these like lines and I, I was even gonna do something very mathematical. I was nerding out, but the idea of like, there are infinite numbers between zero to one, right? So if we are only looking at this or that, we are losing all of the uniqueness and the individualism of people. So yeah, I would say that it's not that they're, be, they're being judged. Maybe they're, people are being categorized because of their sexual orientation or because of their gender identity. And we shouldn't be judging them for that. We should be honoring and celebrating them for that. Good question. See, gosh, kids are just, and teens, they're so evolved. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Palopoulos. That was a great answer. Um, so I'm not seeing any other questions, so we can wrap up in just a minute. Um, I wanted to invite you, Walter, to remind us what it is that Pride Lines does. I don't think we mentioned at the beginning. If you could just remind us what services y'all provide, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Of course. So Pride Lines is Miami's LGBTQ Community okay. Center. One of, um, to Dr. Palopoulos' uh, slides earlier, one of the largest services that we provide is housing support for youth experiencing homelessness. So uh, something around 40% of youth who are experiencing homelessness, youth being under 25, um, identifies LGBTQ. That's a huge disparity. So almost half of youth experiencing homelessness identifies LGBTQ. So what Pride Lines does in response to that is we work directly with the shelters to get them into shelter the same day if we're able to. If not, then we'll put them in a motel until we are able to get them into a shelter. We'll offer relocation assistance. Um, we just recently did that last week for someone who moved here with their partner and uh, was having challenges there and decided that it didn't want, wasn't going to work out. So we uh, got them a plane ticket back to New York. Um, we provide a variety of services. We, in our center here, which I feel like this is so uh, <laughs> not the best way to probably do this, but in our center, which is just under 9,000 square feet, and you can see the other banner I was referring to, that is the same image. Um, we provide a variety of wraparound services. So we have a washer, a dryer, a shower, a clothing closet. We also provide food here. We offer free HIV and STD testing. 
and we host a variety of community support groups. So we have groups for LGBTQ youth. We have groups for people living with HIV. I facilitate a group every other Friday for same gender loving men. Um, and we host a variety of community events. So the best way to stay in touch with us and um, see all the things that we do is via our social media and our website, pridelines.org. Thank you so much, Walter. And um, you guys have a beautiful facility. <laughs> That's really, really wonderful. Um, so yeah, if there aren't any other questions, do you have any uh, parting words for us, Dr. Kalopoulos, before we uh, hang up for today? Yeah, I would. I mean, I know it's a simplification, but like really think about loving one another. We're, re we're living in a really difficult time. Um, so kindness goes a really long way. And asking and validating and just being present for someone can really change a lot of outcomes for them. So I just, you know, I really encourage people to take a moment to do that because it's, it's a hard time right now. So the more we can come together as a world, I think the better we're going to be off. Thank you so much. Um, and so on that note, I'd like to thank you all who joined us here today. And thank you again, Dr. Kalopoulos. Thank you again, Walter from Pride Lines. Um, if, I know you're probably already following us if you're here today, but if not, please follow us at NAMI Miami on Instagram. You can follow us on Facebook. Our website is NAMIMiami.org. If you'd like to get involved, feel free to shoot me an email, kate at NAMIMiami.org, um, and to sign up for our newsletter, which you can also do on our website. So if there aren't any other questions, we'll hang up for today. Thank you so much for joining, and we'll see you next time. So have a great evening, everybody. Thank you so much.